Thank you, Brother Jim. Amen. You remember Brother Jim? Won't he a blessing? That man could sing. I was just thinking as he was singing, you remember it was him and Preston and Verlin and uh, KC and Bernie. And they had a pastor's quartet. You remember that? They made up the pastor's quartet here. And they were so, so good. I mean, they were, as far as I'm concerned, I think they were the best singing group around at that time. And they was going around different churches and different events. But they were a blessing to us. And you know, Brother Jim, as long as I knew him over the years, he couldn't hardly wait till he could sell everything he had here and move back to West Virginia, Ohio. That was his home. And him and his wife, Jane, talked about that so much. They finally sold their home and everything and moved back and hadn't been back long, and God took them home to glory together. A uh, car hit them. They were going to, I think, prayer meeting on a Wednesday night. It was a Sunday night on Wednesday night, and a car hit them head on and killed them both. So anyway, we know we know where he's at. He's singing in heaven right now. And uh, so, But he was a blessing to us here at Blessed Hope. Many other churches around as well. All right, what now? Where do we go from here? Now, I'm going to be a little political this morning. But I'm going to be a little biblical too, okay? Both political and, and biblical. I try to keep it that way as much as I possibly can. Uh, but, you know, I, I guarantee you that same question has crossed your mind, your minds, your hearts this week as well. What now? Where in the world do we go from here? Past few days, we witnessed a new administration that has been sworn in. And it, with an administration that's bringing in an agenda. Now, you think about this, an agenda. That includes politics, I mean policies, social, cultural ideas that I believe are diametrically opposed, my friends, to the principles, the foundation, the pillars of our nation for over 200 years. Now, you might not believe that, agree with me, but I believe I'm right on that. I also believe that this, this, this new administration come, is coming in, that's just been sworn in. I believe also that they're opposed to any semblance of the Judeo-Christian worldview and beliefs that we had and with, that we've enjoyed in our nation, again, for over 200 years. As a matter of fact, I believe they're bringing in a, a worldview, if you will, that is, is totally opposed to a biblical Judeo-Christian worldview as we have enjoyed for so many years in this country. Don't you believe that? And not only that, I believe they're also bringing in a worldview not only opposed to biblical beliefs, but I believe they're bringing in an economic system that's totally opposed to free market, to capitalism, and at the same time, they're bringing in an economic system that many have said, and if you look at what they're doing, what they're promoting, you have to agree that it's socialist, that it's Marxist, and I would say even communist. Now again, you might disagree with me, and we might be cut off of YouTube about this, who knows, yeah, I might be starting that jail ministry one of these days pretty quick. But, you know, three hots and a cot's not that bad when you think about it. At state's expense. <laughs> but I don't want that now if I don't have to. But anyway, this, this is just what I believe. Now, the reason I say all that is because I'm looking at our new president's agenda. And by the executive orders that he has not only done so far, but his intentions for the executive's orders that he's going to that he's going to sign in the next few days. That he's trying to remove everything about the Trump legacy that he possibly can. But at the same time that he is doing that, my friends, he is promoting an agenda, uh, uh, he is promoting a belief system that, that promotes abortion, same-sex marriage, LGBT rights, that movement, he's behind all that. And as a matter of fact, the, the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops just issued this. I read this online just a couple of days ago. You can look it up if you, if you want to as well. This was on Breitbart, I believe, or World Net, Net, Do, World Net News, whatever it is. But anyway, these Catholic bishops met, and they said although the liberal media always says that President Biden is a devout Catholic, you hear that a lot, don't you? He even says it. He's a devout Catholic. But yet they said that his support of, pro, of the pro-abortion agenda and the LGBT, that words now, 
that, that will advance moral evils and threaten human life and dignity in our country. And that's what his own people said, the Catholic bishops of the United States Bishops League. So that's what they said. And so what they're saying is, you know, I believe it myself, don't you? I looked up online as well. He not only believes and promotes that, but in his office as vice president just a few years ago, he performed a wedding ceremony between two men that was on his staff. And he was questioned about that. He said, I was proud to do it because they are great guys. That's the president of our United States now. Now, I don't know how you feel about it. I'm just telling you how I feel. I've got mixed emotions. I am sad. I am angry. I am heartbroken. And a little bit of fear. I don't know where our country is going from here. I listened to one of our great pastors in this country. I listened to him on the net the other night. And he said the same thing. But he said this. He said, talking about the election, everything that's happened the past few days, past few weeks. He said, now listen, we prayed, we stood, we hoped, we fasted. And all over the country, this great prayer, energy, and effort was going on at the same time. We did all that. We did all that we could do, he says. Uh, but the answer from heaven is no. Amen? And I agree with him, don't you? So there was anger, there was hurt. But all, after, after say, having all, said all of that, we wonder why, don't you? We, we wonder why. We, we question this. We say, you know, but we know it's in God's hands. But we still have questions about it. We don't understand it, right? But I've been thinking about a lot of things. And I read this passage of Scripture. Last week, you remember, I changed the Scripture reading right before the message. And I read again from Jeremiah chapter 29. I want you to turn there if you would. And as I was reading that, even as I was reading the Scripture last week, as, I was, as we was reading it together, you know, I saw an analogy there. Now, we know what an analogy is, right? An analogy is, is similarities. It's similarities of like things that you can draw from two different things that you're trying to make a comparative a, you know, point with that, ex explanation a point from that. When you make an analogy of two things, you're seeing likenesses of two different things. And when I read these verses of chapter 29 in Jeremiah, I saw not only one or two analogies, I saw several. Now we know that this is a letter written from the prophet Jeremiah to the uh, captives to the exiles has been deported. They've been evicted from their land, you know, and they've been carried away to Babylon. They're going to be there for a while. As a matter of fact, they're going to be there for 70 years. This is a letter from the prophet Jeremiah, who for 23 years he has been pleading, he's been preaching, he's been begging the people in the land of Judah to repent, get their hearts right with God. Perhaps God might relent concerning this judgment, although deep down I think the prophet knew it was curtains, don't you, as you read this? But he's still pleading. He's still preaching. He's still begging. And he's asking the people to get their hearts right with God. So he's been doing this for many years. But we know that this was the handwriting on the all was already settled. God has taken them off. And God already expressed that in his word that was what's going to happen if they forgot him. So this is a letter to the captives, the exiles that are in Babylon. So I'm going to read starting verse 1 of chapter 29. Now these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem unto the residue of the remnant of the elders which were carried away captives, and to the priest, and to the prophets, to all the people whom King Neb, Nebuchadnezzar had carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. After that Jeconiah the king and the queen and the eunuchs, the princes of Judah, to Jerusalem and Jerusalem, and the carpenters and the smiths were departed from Jerusalem, and all, they'd just been evicted, they'd been removed to Babylon. He sent this letter by the hand of Elisa, the son of Shaphan, of, and Gomorrah, the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, saying, Thus saith the Lord, the Lord capitalized small letters, which means this is from Jehovah God himself. This is the word of God. I've got a message to you from Jehovah Yahweh God himself, Jeremiah says to the people. Listen. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, and to all that are carried away captives, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build ye houses, dwell in them, plant gardens, eat the fruit of them. Take ye wives, beget sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons. Give your daughters to husbands, 
that they may bear sons and daughters, that you may be increased there and not diminished. I want to see you multiply, God says to the people of Israel. And listen, while you're there, while you're in Babylon, while you're in this pagan, ungodly, wicked, idolatrous environment, seek the peace of the city where they have caused you to be carried away captives. And pray unto the Lord for it. For in the peace thereof shall you have peace. You pray for peace. You pray for prosperity uh, wherever you're at, whatever city you're in, whatever land you're in. And if the peace and, and God bless you with peace and prosperity, guess what? You're going to be blessed as well. Isn't that what he's saying? For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Let not your prophets and your diviners that be in the midst of you deceive you, neither hearken to your dreams which you cause to be dreamed. In other words, there's going to be false prophets there. There's going to be, there's going to be hacks. There's going to be uh, those who are going to be saying, You're just going to be here for a few days. God's going to turn all this thing around. He's going to defeat King Nebuchadnezzar. He's going to bring you back. But Jeremiah says, no, you're going to be there for 70 years. Right? He says, and he goes on to say, verse 9. He says, they prophesy falsely unto you in my name. Now God is saying this through the prophet. I have not sent them, saith the Lord. For thus saith the Lord, I, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you, perform my good word toward you, and cause you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall you call upon me, and you shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you, and you shall seek me and find me, when you shall search for me with all of your heart. Do you remember what Daniel did in Daniel chapter, and this is kind of going to the side, Daniel chapter 9 verse 2, he was reading from the prophet Jeremiah, and he was reading Jeremiah 25, verse 12, I think it is, where the prophet said, you're going to be there for 70 years. Daniel was realizing that, hey, man, we're getting close to that time period that's going to be up. And so what did he do? Right then, you can go to look at that chapter later sometime today, maybe, or this week. And what did Daniel do? He realized that, hey, it's, it's just about over. So what did he do? He turned his eyes toward Jerusalem, and that old boy started praying. God, do what you said. We're ready to go now, Lord. So that's what he did. So after seven years, he says, I'm going to do all this. He says, I know the thoughts I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. Then shall you call upon me, and you shall go and pray to me, and I will hearken to you. You shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. And I will be found of you, saith the Lord. And then he says, I will turn away your captivity. And notice this. And I will gather you from all the nations from, and from all the places whither I have driven you, saith the Lord. And I will bring you again into the place whence I caused you to be carried away. Because you have said, the Lord hath raised us up prophets in Babel. Now, verse 16 through 19, I'm going to read this because this comes into another analogy that I kind of see as I read this. Know that thus saith the Lord of the king that sitteth upon the throne of David, and of all the people that dwelleth in this city, and of your brethren that are not gone forth as you into captivity. In other words, some of them refused to go. They were stubborn. They said, no way, Jose, we're going to stay right here. Even after the prophet said, no, you better go, you better go. This is of God. All this is of God. You better listen to his word. But they wouldn't do it. Now, for those, listen, that did not obey, they did not listen to the Lord, those that were left behind. Those that were left behind. Look at verse 17. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will send upon them the sword, the famine, the pestilence, and make them like vile figs that cannot be eaten. They are so evil. And I will persecute them with the sword and with the famine and with the pestilence. And will deliver them to be removed to all the kingdoms of the earth to be a curse and an astonishment and a hissing and a reproach among all the nations where I have driven them because they have not hearkened to my words, saith the Lord, which I sent unto them by my servants, the prophets, rising up early, sending them, but you would not hear me, saith the Lord. Now, can you see an analogy in that? Now, I can you might not can, but I can. I see several analogies in this. As I think about what, is, what happened to Judah, the Israel before Judah, 
And then I look at us today. I can see likenesses. I can see similarities here. And I think we ought to listen to the Word of God. And I think as we do this, as we listen to the instructions, you know, to these captives, to those exiles, those who've been carried away, because in a sense, I believe we have been, we're kind of like exiles. Erwin Lutzer wrote a book, The Church in Babylon. I don't know if you read that. I, I told you about that a few times. He got from someone, another writer who was saying that, you know, because we, we are held captive in this, in this godless culture, we ought to just kind of form monastic groups of believers together, kind of isolate ourselves apart from the rest of the culture and society itself and just build these little communities that we're going to obey God. So that come about because of the wickedness that we're seeing prevailing in our land today. So in a sense, we are being more so today than we were just a few weeks ago. Held captive as being exiled, even while we're in our own land. So what are we to do? Where do we go from here? Do you ever ask that? Several things I can deduce from this passage here as I'm reading this. And I want you to see this. Number one, okay, number one. If you want to write notes or whatever. Number one, we need to understand that everything that happened as we look at this passage was ordained, decreed by Jehovah God himself. You see verse four? Look, if you would, at verse four. He says, uh, well, verse one, first. Verse 1, now these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem unto the residue, the remnant of the elders which were carried away captives, to, and to the priests, and to the prophets, and to all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar, listen, listen to this, had carried away captive from Jerusalem. The NIV says this, and it's a little bit more graphic and precise in the NIV. It says this, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all of those I carried unto exile. You see that? This letter, God says, this, I carried you into exile. It wasn't just King Nebuchadnezzar. It wasn't just the Chaldeans. It wasn't just the Babylonians. Listen, this is from me. I ordained this. I decreed this. He says, this is from me. Verse 7, he says the same thing. Look at verse 7. Seek the peace uh, the city where the I have caused you to be carried away captives. In other words, everything that happened to you, the horrible siege itself, all the awful catastrophes that happened to you, listen, I caused it. I did it. This is from the hand of God. This is from me. The reason you have been evicted is because I evicted you. I threw you out of your land. It wasn't, God is saying to the people here, listen, it wasn't fate, it wasn't an accident, it wasn't a tragic turn of events, it wasn't a coincidence, it's providence. It's providence. I did this. Now listen, everything that happened here to, the, to God's chosen people, Judah, Israel, it didn't catch God by surprise. It didn't just slip up on him. It didn't catch him by surprise. It wasn't that... Uh, God himself was, uh, and his people was ambushed, surprised by the enemy, tricked by Satan, out-strategized by the devil in this war of ages, and they all just lost this simple battle here. No, God says everything that happens to you, that has happened to you, that's even happened to you right now, was planned, was purposed, was permitted by me. This is from me. It's all from my hand. The destruction of Jerusalem, the siege, all the horrible events that you read about, even in the book of lamentations now of course god will allow satan to do these things right we know that look at the book of job we can understand that but yet who's the sovereign god of all of this think about this it's from him it's from him and i think that's the first thing we need to see this and to understand this it's all at the end of the day listen it's from god and actually it should have been expected from the people right should have been should have been expected from the people of Judah, right? Because when you think about it, you even go back to the book of Leviticus. You go back to the book of Leviticus, chapter 26. You go to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 28. They were warned through Moses, by God through Moses. Listen, they were warned that if you forsake me, if you adopt the pagan gods or the pagan people all around them, if it ever comes a time that you forsake me, you forget me, you turn your backs upon me, 
God said about eight or ten things in those passages. I'll do this to you. I'll cause famine. I'll cause you to starve. I'll send pestilence. I'll send disease. I'll send wars. I'll do all of this. And lastly, you know what I'll do to you? I'll scatter you, listen, among all nations. You will be evicted from your lands. God warned them that, so it shouldn't have been a surprise to them. Amen? He warned them about that. And then he said, and you go to the earlier chapters in the book of Jeremiah, and he says in Jeremiah chapter 2, verses 17 and 19, chapter 4, verse 18, and chapter 5, verse 19, you brought this on your own self. You procured these evil, terrible, horrible, awful things upon your own self by your own doing. I sent you prophets. We read it a few minutes ago. I sent you preachers, prophets. Jeremiah, he's been pleading. He's been begging. But you said, no, no, no. Don't want it. Don't want part of it. I'm going to do my own thing. The prophet, as far as I'm concerned, can drop dead. We got these good ear ticklers in the way, just tickling our ears, making us feel good, saying everything's going fine, honky dory. So don't want to hear Jeremiah. Don't want to hear a true man of God. Amen? So that's what happened. So God says you, you did. They even got to the point that they couldn't even blush anymore. That's what the word says. Can't even blush anymore. It got to the point of no return. I preached that many times. Even got to the place where God says, listen, I don't care if Daniel was here, if Moses was here, I'd still judge the land. Isn't that what he said, folks? So it shouldn't have su surprised them, shouldn't have caught them by surprise, and it shouldn't catch us by surprise what has happened to us as well. Psalms 9, 17. You, you, I won't turn now, but what does it say? All the wicked and every nation that forgets God will be turned into hell. God says, I'll destroy you. So look, if you think about it, if you look at the direction that our nation has been going for the past 60 years, right? We've said to God, essentially, we don't want no part of you. Now, I know we've got good godly people that's, that's still been praying and serving the Lord and worshiping and following the Lord. But yet overall, as, as overall our, our nation as a whole has said to God, well, we can make it just fine without you. I mean, you look at what they did to the Bible, to prayers, and you get right on down the line, the Ten Commandments. I mean, look at what's been happening in our public educational system. Look at abortion itself. Last week was right to life Sunday. You know, uh, we didn't even observe that, didn't say anything about it. But we, we was just thinking about the sanctity of life Sunday last week. And since all this horrible law was passed, when was it, in 73? Over 60 million babies have been murdered in the womb. And now, we've got, again, we've got another administration that's coming there, and now they're going to undo everything that's been set up by the Republicans. This always happens. Republicans will come in there, and they will, and they will, and that's a name for it. I can't, don't have it before me. What was the name of that? Mexico City policy, come under President Reagan. Remember that? Stopped all abortions around the world, funded by our federal government to help people have abortions around the world. Remember they stopped that under Reagan. Of course, when the Democrats come in under, under Clinton, you know, they reverse it. They reverse it. They start back funding again the abortions uh, uh, on federal, uh, around the world through the federal funds that sent in from our country. And so it was stopped during the Trump's administration. So guess what? It's going to start back again, the Mexico City policy. So he's promoting all of that, you see. So you look at that, and then you look at, more recently, the legalizing of same-sex marriage. And you look at the LGBTQ. Have they had anything else to it? Yeah. You can't even say, address people as he, she. You think we're going to get by with this, folks? There's no, if, as God is in heaven, we're not going to get by with it. So this should not take us by surprise. As Judah, so is America. It's simply this. It's a principle of sowing and reaping. Isn't that right? We have sown to the wind. What are we doing now? We're reaping the whirlwind. This is not a real positive message, is it? But I'm telling you the truth. We're reaping the fruit of our own doing. So analogy number one, as it was for Judah, so it is for America. 
So it shouldn't catch us so high. So, and we shouldn't blame God for this. Now, that brings me to the second analogy I can do, do from this. God always has a plan. He's always got a plan. And there's always a purpose for his plan. He's not, not playing it by ear, you know. He's not. He, he's always got a plan. You can see this in verses 10 and 11, can't you? He said, in, in this letter, he says, Thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you. It calls you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you. Good thoughts. I've got plans for you. So God was, was this 70 years didn't just happen on the spur of a moment. God planned this out in eternity past, folks. If you believe what the Word of God tells us. Now, and this is a message in itself, and I had not got a whole lot of time to get there. But I want you to see this, folks. I, you, you've got to understand that through all this, God has got a plan. Seventy years. What about this 70 years? Why 70 years? Why is he exiling? Why is he throwing them out? Why is he evicting them from the land for 70 years? Why is he doing that? 70 years. One thing we know is going to be a seven-year purge, right? He's going to clean them up. Because at the end of that seven years, you see it in the Word now, he's going to be, they're going to know us at the end of that 70 years through men like Daniel who's already going to be deported, already there. And they're going to start pleading with God, praying. They're going to get themselves cleaned up. And God's going to bring them back into the land. But why 70 years? There's a plan involved with that as well. So look, if you would, if you take your Bible and go back to the book of Leviticus, chapter, go back first to 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verses 20 and 21. Look at that if you would. And them that had escaped from the sword carried he away to Babylon, while they were servants to him and his sons until the reign of the kingdom of Persia, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah unto the land, until the land, now listen to this, until the land had enjoyed her Sabbath, for as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath, to fulfill threescore and ten years. Now why did God do that? Go back, if you would, in the book of Leviticus. Go back to Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 25. Seventy years, you saw that, right? Why 70 years? Leviticus chapter 25. Look at verse 1 of Leviticus chapter 25. And the Lord spake unto Moses in Mount Sinai, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them. These, these are specific instructions for the people of Israel. When you come into the land which I give you, then shall the land keep a Sabbath unto the Lord. Got me so far? That's going to be a Sabbath year. At the end of every six years, you're going to have a Sabbath year. Six years thou shalt sow thy field. You're going to plant your crops. Six years you'll not only sow and plant your crops, but you'll prune your vineyard. Then you'll gather in the fruit there. But in the seventh year, the seventh year shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the land, a Sabbath for the Lord. Thou shalt neither sow, plant, nor thy field, nor prune thy vineyard. That which groweth of its own accord of thy harvest shalt thou not reap, neither garner the grapes of the vine undressed, for it is a year of rest unto the land. Now, we don't have time to turn that, but if you'll look later at Deuteronomy chapter 31, I believe it is, verses 10 through 13, not only were the Israelites supposed to give the land a rest that year, but they were supposed to go for one of the feasts. And during that time, the priest, the Levites, was to instruct them into the, in the word of the Lord, the law, out of the law. So that was a year of instruction. That was a year of rest. And that was a year of reflection about what God was to them, what the law what meant to them. It, it was designed by God specifically for a purpose. But guess what? From the time of King Saul up until this time, they didn't observe that. Dr. Ryrie says it was a time of special instruction in the law of God, if you look at that later. But the Israelites, those of Judah and of Israel, they said, no way. They didn't do it. So what did God do as a result of that? 
he says, we're going to give the land a rest. <laughs> We're going to catch up on this sabbatical rest. And guess what? That land's going to be resting while you are in this pagan land for 70 years. So what, what do you see here, folks? Behind all of this, the hand of God is moving. He's always got a plan. He's always got a perfect purpose of everything that's going on. Uh, Sean mentioned this just a couple of weeks ago he, on, on a Wednesday night. He spoke out of the book of Habakkuk, and I've done that many times as well. We've seen that. Habakkuk, the prophet, the last days before Judah was carried off into exile by the Babylonians, he prays, he pours out his heart to God. He said, Lord, look at the land. It's evil, it's wicked, all this ungodliness, this wickedness, lawlessness. Lord, you can't let this go on. You've got to do something. I've been praying, I've been pleading with you. Lord, why don't you move? You've got to do something. And God's answer to the prophet Habakkuk, <laughs> I mean, I am doing something. I'm already raising up the Chaldeans, and they're going to come in here, and they're going to sack your land. They're going to wipe you as one will wipe a dish. That's what's going to happen. You remember that passage of the scripture? See, all, behind, all that time, God was already working, wasn't he? So we look at this. God was, he's got a plan. He's got a purpose for everything that he is doing. Now, this brings me to another one of my analogies. I look at this. As bad as this is, God's got a plan for it. Look, listen to me a minute. Very careful, listen to me. I've heard this over and over, and I know you have as well. People are still asking why. They're questioning, why didn't God answer our prayers? There's never been as much prayer effort and energy that's went on before in our land than it has preceding this election. I mean, it was prayer chains around the clock throughout this country, right? I mean, Franklin Graham led a prayer group to the nation's capital. Remember that? All those thousands of people that went up there, saints of God, praying and pleading with God. You remember that? Jonathan Carn did the same thing, the Harbinger man. Remember that? And Eric, Mata and different ones. The prophets come on the scene and the prognosticators and all this. And God's going to keep Trump in there, President Trump in there for four more years. And this is going to happen, that's going to happen. you remember all that? Do you remember that? Yeah. But after all that, all that said and done, God says no. And we wonder why. And we wonder why. We question God. God has failed us. God has let us out. He's answered that we just do not understand it. God is working, folks. I submit to you this. I, this is my thinking now. <laughs> Pastor's got a right to speculate, right? Amen? This is my thinking. I look at all of this and, and I, I remind myself what I said a few weeks ago. Remember I read that little thing out of that devotional to y'all? Well, uh, these people, this man, this man wrote this who's been in prisons for his faith. And he said, I've seen prisoners on their knees praying and pleading for America because America is the last hope. It's the last damn. It's the last defense against communism worldwide. You remember that? America is the last hope for freedom, for liberty, for life to go on, the great defender of the helpless nations around the world. And if America goes, then it's all over. Haven't you heard that? It's all over for the rest of the world. So I'm looking there and I'm wondering, huh, what's going on here? Then I start hearing different words about the Great Reset. And I start hearing things about the World Economic Forum. I start hearing things about globalism. I start hearing about the one world order. And you know what my mind is thinking, right? And you might be saying, oh, here he goes again. The great sensationalist pastor. Oh, where is he going to stop it? Listen, folks, I'm just calling it as it is. I'm just telling you what I see, what I think. As I look at the events worldwide, how they're shaping up the nations of the world, and I read the Bible, the scriptures, I'm trying to put all this together and bring my thoughts and I pray and ask the Lord to help me to understand everything that's going on. And I wonder why too. And I said, God's at work. He's got a plan. All these things are happening around the world. You think this is by accident? Think about it. Now just put on your thinking caps. That's what teachers used to tell us. Put on your thinking caps, Donnie, and stand between the lines. Have flashbacks every now and then. That's those old teachers we had. But think about it. All these things is happening worldwide. The great lawlessness times that we're living in. The wickedness that's going on. Worldwide. Not just in America. Worldwide. Uh, for the first time in history. 
first time in history, you think about this, there's, there's Iran, there's Russia, there's Turkey, there are allies. These are the three nations that is going to invade Israel. Latter days invasion of Israel, Ezekiel 38, chapter 38 and 39. You with me so far? Now think about it with me, if you will, again. i say that again. But if President Trump was still in office and Israel was invaded by these three nations, what would have happened? You know we would have. You think he would have permitted that? You think he would have sat back and said, well, we'll just pray for him. Ain't no way in the world. He'd have sent everything he in there to bomb them to smithereens. So as I see it, for this to happen in Ezekiel 38, he, had not, he couldn't be in there if we're close to that. As I see it, as I look at Revelation, read Revelation chapter 13, and see the rise of the Antichrist with this new world order, this globalism and all that, and I'm thinking about that, the world economic, what they're all saying. Ah, to me, folks, the great reset might be the great rapture of the church. And we're going to be getting out of here soon. Amen. Dr. McGee, if he don't come soon, I'm going to have to change my theology. But do you see what I'm saying? Do you see an analogy there? And finally, one other thing, maybe a couple other things. You give me a couple more minutes so I can finish this. You don't want me to go on and carry this over next week, do you? I know you don't. So listen to me. Think, think about this, if you will. Now I want you to go back to the passage and look at this until then. Until then. Think about this. Until then. I'm talking about the rapture, tribulation, whatever. Until they, what now, what do we do? Build houses, dwell in them, plant gardens, eat the fruit of them. Take wives, beget sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons. Give your daughters to husbands that they may bear sons and daughters. That you may be increased there and not diminished. And seek the peace of the city where I have caused you to be carried away captives. Pray unto the Lord for it. For in the peace they have, you shall have peace. What is God saying here while we're waiting? What are we to do? Live life to the fullest. Amen? Live life to the fullest. Go on and live life. And you'll see the rest of the passage. He's saying, you seek me with all your heart, with all your faith. You seek my face, and I'm going to bless you. He is saying this. We need as believers, as children of God, in this hostile, wicked Cultural culture that we're living, we need to let people see Christ in us like we've never, like they've never seen him before. Amen. We need to go on and live life. We need to plan out our lives. We need to have, see our children get married in the Lord. We need and pray that they'll have children. Amen. Have children and more children and more children. You have some more children. Stop, son. It don't matter. See what I'm saying? Live life to the fullest, men. This is why I tell my grandchildren, I've got, I've got three grandchildren. I've got one's going to be a doctor. She's fixed second year of medical school. Isn't that wonderful? I pray that she'll be the greatest doctor while she's here that, that anyone could possibly be. I've got a couple of engineers to be, and I hope they'll make great engineers. I've got one fixing to graduate from Carolina. I know you love that, Chapel Hill. And yes, sir, Reed. And I'm excited about that. And I say, if you, got, you do the best at what you can do, whatever you're doing, you live life to the fullest. You live life, have careers, have children, and, be, and listen, above all, in these days of the pandemic, let people see Christ in your lives. Church, this means for us, what a wonderful opportunity. We can, we can show Jesus to the rest of the world. Work, do for others. Be there for one another. Serve one another here in this church, right? Find out there's needs among our people. Just church be the church until Jesus comes. And while you're doing it, keep on sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Warn them, plead with them, beg with them. Because when that rapture takes place, we don't want to see our children or grandchildren left behind. Now, if they don't listen to the word of God, if they don't listen to the preaching of the word of God, if they don't get the hearts of Christ, listen, when that horn does trumpet does sound, they're going to be left behind. Just like these people. See that other analogy right there I was trying to share with you? They didn't listen to the prophets. They didn't listen to the preachers. They didn't listen to the people that God sent them to beg them, to pray with them, to get them to get their hearts right with God. So they were not carried away into exile. They were left behind. 
God says one day I'm going to come back. I'm going to gather you from all the nations wherever I've sent you. I'm going to bring you back. He's going to do that with Israel in the future events of the time. We know that's going to happen. But one day, church, he's coming for us. Amen? He is coming for us. So that's the way I see it. What now? Until then, where do we go from here? Just keep on being the church. And smiling and loving everybody. Telling people about Christ. Amen. Let's stand if I hear it's bad. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for your precious word. This always has an answer for us, Lord. As we read it. As we search it. As we delve into it. As we pray as we seek your face, you have got a word for us. And we know, Lord, that even right now in these seemingly desperate and despondent times that we are living in, you are working. You are working. You are moving in history. Your will is being accomplished, even right now. We look at things that are happening today, Lord, and we hear different ones, Lord, with uh, uh air of despair and depression and saying we have lost we have lost we have lost but we haven't lord we are winners and in the end we win lord because you win we can't lose praise your holy name now we pray lord if there's anyone here today that has not given their hearts to christ they're not saved never trusted the lord jesus christ here or listen by the radio or watching us on social media if they've never given their hearts to Jesus I pray dear Holy Spirit please open our hearts to understand where they are right now Lord how they really need to give their heart their life to you don't believe we're going to have many more opportunities Lord to do that in this dispensation of time so speak to hearts move hearts and may your will be done in Jesus name we pray Amen now